Okay, thank you, Chibi, for the introduction. I will start right away because I have a lot of material I want to cover. So today I will talk about AI ethics and some challenges and then some recommendations. So um, just as before, I want to mention this new institute from Northeastern in Experiential AI that basically wants to, to uh, uncover what, was in, what is important in successful AI applications, like uh, having humans in the loop or better humans in control, and also the strong dependency on data instead of uh, better algorithms, and usually big data when most of the companies have small data. So I will start with the main ethical issues that for me, so I have a personal bias here, and, and these are the, the, the four main ones, discrimination, phrenology, lack of semantic understanding, and then excessive use of resources. And then I want to, to discuss uh, a few things that are related to this, and at the end, some recommendations. So let's start with the main problem in discrimination, so the course of bias. So you have biased data. Remember, uh, information is bias. So uh, we have a bias to understand bias in a negative sense, but in practice, bias can be positive too. So it's just a systematic deviation, in some cases it's bad, in some cases it's good. So the question is, should an algorithm should be neutral or fair against the negative biases? And that's not an easy question because it's not a computer science question, it's a, like a so social question. So typically uh, this question is not asked and we get the same bias, but even worse, sometimes bias is amplified. If bias is amplified, we cannot say that the bias comes in the data. In fact, bias is not only in the data, and I hope that with uh, the examples I will mention, it's clear that although that's the main source of bias, there are many other things that, that may uh, uh, introduce bias in, in a system. So, a very well-known cartoon for many people, so for the difference between equality, equity, and justice. Usually, we try to do equity because justice takes a long time, it is much harder to achieve. If you're interested in this topic, I really recommend this movie, Coded Bias, this documentary, you can find it in Netflix, uh, done mainly by women, and uh, for me much better than, than the social networks one that was last year. And we did a very interesting panel with uh, a federal judge and uh, three other computer scientists in uh, March, uh, it's organized by ACM and that's available in YouTube. Okay, so what is the, the answer to this question? Should we care? Well, not always, as usual. Uh, when, when you have a hard question, the, the answer depends. But if we harm people, uh, you need to basically care about this question. And we'll get back to this at the end. Now, how you handle this problem where the, 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 easiest, the, the best solution would be to the bias the input, but sometimes we don't know the bias, or sometimes we don't know the right reference value. Another possibility is to tune the algorithm, so there are things like uh, learning to rank with, with bias, that uh, learn how to handle certain specific bias, but again, you need to know the bias, you cannot do it in general. And finally, you can debias the output. Uh, but in that case, you already lost a lot of information and, and the solution will be partial. Now, the first uh, example of discrimination that reached the headline news, I, I guess, was uh, the, the Compass case, where ProPublica in 2016 uh, uh, claimed that there was a racial bias, uh, very large racial bias, in uh, basically criminal profiling to get, for example, uh, conditional uh, freedom. In, in, in prisons. And although this was created as a support tool, in many places in the US was being used was be, was used at, as, a, as a decision tool. And here we have two important questions that can we can pose from this example. Is a secret algorithm ethical? So basically do we want transparency on how, for example, a person will will be uh, predicted to to be a potential criminal in the future or not? However, Together with this question, we have another one that's very important. Is a public algorithm safe? Because this can be gamed. So you have these two uh, things that are important that are really uh, are in conflict. Criminal profiling is something that has been done not only for prison, but also for, for basically when police stops a person in the street. Uh, for example, Palantir has a famous uh, system, Godam, that has been used in some US cities without 
uh, basically the knowledge of, of most of the people, and even in some European countries. The same in Chicago, uh, the system that was built with IIT. And here you have a, a particular case of the system that you have geographic sampling bias because you police the region where you think there are more criminals. And then, of course, you uh, basically reinforce that belief because all the other crimes that are not reported elsewhere will not be in, in the system. Let me give you an example why why bias can be amplified. And this is an interesting paper by Kleinberg et al. that was published a few years ago. Uh, let's say you have an offender, and, 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 and this is a, the, the example is a bail in, in the state of New York. Uh, typically, in most of the world, you need to think if the person will reoffend or if will appear in court. Well, in New York, you only have to, the judge only have to predict if the person will appear in court or not. Doesn't matter if it was a serial killer or not, which is, I think, very hard as, as a person to basically not think about that. Now, if the person gets bail and can pay, good. If the person doesn't, cannot pay, there's always people there. There's a person in the US that even loans money to people and they have to do the same prediction of the judge. Will this person appear in court and return the money? And finally, if you don't get bail, you go to prison. Here we have one problem, is that we don't know what would have happened if the person had bail. So we have half the data, and then we need to do data imputation. We need to infer or predict what would have happened if that person had bail or not. Well, uh, the results are very interesting. So assuming that the prediction of the system is correct, they were able to decrease the crime rate in 25% or decrease the prison rate in 42%, so much better than the judges. Even for the 1% most dangerous criminals, the judges were doing like big mistakes. Now, they, 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 there was an interesting data methodology because they split uh, the data in five parts, like a holdout, uh, data for imputation, data for training, and, and data in a lockbox, so anyone can test it later with data that the, the algorithm never saw. Now, uh, this uh, algorithm was, didn't have, have too much data, so it was not good enough for, for deep learning but also they want to have some interpretability, so they used uh, gradient boosted decision trees. And the only demographic feature they used was the age. Um, you could, gender is mostly men, so that doesn't make much difference. And, and there's nothing else. The rest is just information on the case. Well, what was the result? In red, I added, this is a table from the paper, in red, I added the percentage of people that uh, is uh, black or Hispanic in New York, and you have 32%. But you already see that it's a big percentage, uh, much higher percentage on the people that the police brings to uh, the court. So it's 82%. Well, the judges are clearly are racist in the sense that they increase the rate of blacks to 57%. They decrease a little bit the Hispanic more white, 32%, but in total, the 82% goes up to 89%. What happened with the algorithm? Well, the algorithm uh, learned to be racist and basically amplified the racist against African-Americans, so the 57 went up to 60%, and also amplified the decrease in the Hispanic from 32 to 30%. But overall, the, the minority grew from 89% to 90%. Now, you can, the good thing about the algorithm, you can match a different force, different distributions, and then if you match based on the, uh, basically the best judge, the system still was able to do much better, like minus 23% less crime. But why is this is happening? Well, we can look at uh, different types of judges. So the, in the paper, they divided judges in, in five quintiles of different leniency. And if you say, okay, you want to send uh, additional people to prison, so don't get bail, you see that the algorithm here will take the most dangerous one for the algorithm. However, if we see, according to the algorithm, what the judges are doing in the second quintile, it's almost like random. So basically, they are f 
giving bail to people that is dangerous or to people that is not dangerous. And here we have part of the reason for this. So you can have noisy decisions like B, you can have biased decisions like C, and you can have both biased and noisy decisions like D. So what is better? A biased algorithm that is just in the sense that to the same case always gives the same result, or a judge that for the same case will give different results. There are papers that show that if you see a judge after lunch, it's one of the worst times you can see it, because if you didn't have lunch, it will be tougher. So uh, this issue about noise was uh, um, covered in the Harvard Business Review in 2016 by uh, Kahneman and collaborators, but this year in May, they, he published a book called Noise, basically focusing on problem of uh, the variability of human decisions, and this in some cases may be more dangerous than uh, bias. In fact, uh, one good thing about algorithms is that they don't have noise. Another example is discrimination, facial recognition. So in this paper that was published earlier this year, you see these four phases of facial recognition, and if you see who, from where the faces came in the last two phases, basically from 2007 after, and you see that most of them came from the web. Well, those didn't have any consent. So there's like everything was developed with no consent of the people to use their faces. Well, you know, there were people accused of uh, a crime wrongly because of this uh, facial recognition system that were not well trained with some minority populations. And after this, in June 13, 2020, uh, many companies decided not to sell this uh, software to police enforcement. In June 30, uh, we at the ACM US Technology Policy Committee also urged to suspend the use of facial recognition technologies. But it was a bit too late because the software was already out. And for example, in September of 2020, another African-American was wrongly accused of a crime because of a failure of the software. And there are similar problems in language translation with gender bias or uh, stereotypes. For example, here you have a famous paper from Neurips in 2016, where if you have chi he analogies, if she's a nurse, he's a surgeon, or she's a diva, he's a superstar. So there are, are things coming from the text that are biased. The same with uh, coming from word embeddings, for example, who are the most typical uh, professions for different uh, uh, ethnic groups, like Hispanic, Asian, or white. Well, what about language models? And this has been in the news lately. Now we have GPT-4. GP, GPT I don't have this here, but the, the size will be about similar to, I think it's about five, uh, 500 uh, billion parameters. Well, in a paper this year, they showed that GPT-3 has anti-Muslim bias. For example, if you write the sentence, two Muslims walked into A, you have all these um, completions that most of them are violent. So this is what you learn from the news. And if you look at what happens with different religions, you see that for Muslim, it's four times more violent than Christians, and good news for many of us, the less violent are Buddhist and atheist. But it can be much more complicated. In ads, in the example where last year uh, the UK government decided to predict the final uh, scores uh, for university uh, entrance without having the students taking the exam because of COVID, of course, the minorities were affected. Or, for example, this interesting case in uh, Bologna, Italy, in uh, early this year, where uh, Deliveroo was found to be uh, doing implicit discrimination. Uh, this is a, a platform similar to Uber Eats for the people in the US. And the main reason was that 
basically the model learned to give more work to people that could deliver food at night, dinner time. And of course, the people that couldn't do that had less work. So basically, they didn't, they didn't have a rule of let's try to give the same work to everyone. And they were uh, fine, symbolically, but that was important because that means that the source of the bias can come from the optimization function. And the worst problem of discrimination is basically what happened in Netherlands also in January this year, where 26,000 families for several years were wrongly accused of uh, cheating in uh, child care subsidies. And at the end, the result was that the government, the whole government had to resign uh, on early uh, January. So this is maybe the worst case of how AI can affect not only people, but also can affect governments. Let's go to the second one. Really, it's not phrenology, but it's physiognomy but most people understand better what is phrenology. And the first one is from uh, what's the most well-known from Kosinski from Stanford that basically uh, use facial biometrics to predict social, sexual orientation. So is there any scientific basis for that? But even if there is a scientific basis, should you do that? So there are two different questions. It's ethical scientifically and it's ethically morally, socially. And the same happened in 2017 when some researchers in China tried to, to predict uh, criminality using face images. And also last year, again, but in the US, the same happens. And of course, people complain because you, your face cannot give away traits of your personality. Kosinski came back early this year basically claiming that he could uh, uh, predict the political orientation. This was like a 70% accuracy. That could be even uh, spurious correlations. So this phrenology is something that was dead in 19th century. For example, when Dr. Cesare Lombroso in Torino, Italy, uh, collected hundreds of schools thinking that criminals had a different skull. At least he was a real believer because he left also his uh, skeleton, I guess as a ground truth, uh, of what he thought was a good person. So, But I don't know if, if a good person will collect all his life uh, skulls from the morgue. But it can be worse. In 2019, uh, MIT research uh, claimed that with uh, your voice, I can draw your face. I wonder how they will do it for adopted children, and maybe that may work for the neck or the mouth, but what about the eyes, your nose, ears, hair? What relation has that with your voice? So I can have my master phrenology algorithm where you give me a voice, I draw your face, and from your face I can guess your name. Yes, there is a patent application for Mitter that claims that can, they can predict your name from your face. And then I used all the other work to know if you are in the position, if you are uh, gay, or if you are a criminal. In many countries, this is really dangerous. So you shouldn't do this. And then we have the third problem, lack of semantic understanding. Uh, in 1979, George Walk says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. He was talking about the statistics, but I think today we can say the same about machine learning. So. Sometimes you don't use the right data. For example, the best example we have is uh, also January this year when Elon Musk said, use Signal and some software, a stock market software that use uh, tweet, tweets, uh, thought that he was uh, saying that they should buy the stock of this Texas company that went the price for, for more than 400% more. So the company was happy, uh, the people that bought was not that much happy. But it could be even more stupid. For example, uh, someone in Facebook decided to use a, a model trained in English for bad words, and the town of Biche in Facebook was three weeks without their Facebook page. Part of the problem was no human in the loop to check for, for these uh, complaints. And this may have harmed people because the, the, the Facebook 
page was used, for example, for COVID announcements. Or you can have a, an example from adversarial AI, like here on the right, from some Japanese researchers, where you change one pixel, and then you get a different, uh, um, a different level. So the question is, what this person is uh, learning? I don't know. So some limitations. Uh, we have to remember how to forget. It's hard to forget. Filter what you learn. Uh, you have a very interesting story from Borges about that. You cannot learn what's not in the data. Um, you shouldn't wait until someone dies, like in Arizona, for a self-driving car. That case was not in the data. And accuracy is not the key. It's the impact of errors, the issue. Um, and we need to be humble. We should say, I don't know when we don't know. And let me give you 30 seconds because I, I didn't realize I have enough battery. So let me put the, uh, the charger on. I will be just in one minute, one second. So sorry about that, I will continue. So the last one is waste of resources. Here you have the same uh, table before of large language models, and this came from Bender and Gebru. So in this paper, uh, Bender and Gebru show that uh, the carbon footprint of training a transformer was 57 years of the person, normal person. And then also that this was uh, between $1 million and $3 million per training. So the question is, are we using these resources well to, to train world embeddings that basically are uh, biased to many problems? And you may know this uh, famous paper, the Stochastic Parrot, that was part of the problem where uh, this ended with the uh, layoff of Timothy Gebrus from Google and also later from Margaret Mitchell for a similar reason. So, let me then go to the discussion of what we can do. So, these seven properties were proposed by the ACM in 2017, and systems do not need to be perfect, but it seems that people expect much more from AI than, than what we can do because humans judge machines much harder than people. Uh, some people is already uh, working on how to uh, do uh, AI software that is trustworthy. And the question in the future will be how to develop software with the help of AI. This diagram is a, from a paper from Ben Schneiderman last year. We have issues on data protection, identity and privacy. Uh, for example, data nudging. So basically, uh, you have the consent legal basis, uh, how much data you collect, how much time you store that data, and for example, in privacy power, power from Carisabellis, you can uh, go deeper in these issues. If you look at Article 22 of GDPR, uh, the last paragraph says that the person can contest the decision. This means that you may need interpretability to give people information about the processing. You get to explainability to challenge a decision. And you need to do validation, testing, and maintenance to keep the system working as intended. And here is an interesting example of how this Article 22 has been already used legally uh, in France, uh, where a court said that using facial recognition in schools 
was uh, inconstitutional, uh, unconstitutional because they didn't have the competence, they didn't have the consent of the people, and the solution was also not proportional to the goal. We also have uh, already some U.S. regulation. There are cases against Amazon, Google, and Facebook in different parts of the uh, federal system. Uh, during Trump, a few laws, even one that was proposed by Kamala Harris, didn't pass, so we may see this coming. Also, Khan, the person that was uh, writing about anti truth already uh, on Amazon a few years ago, is in charge of this. So we expect that the new uh, National AI Office will address these problems. In last April, the EU proposed a regulation for AI, and basically they use a risk-based approach, and this already is some problematic because uh, risk is a continuous variable. For example, here in Article 5, you see that they, are, they forbid any use of a uh, subliminal technique that basically can distort the person's behavior that may cause a physical or psychological harm. So if you apply this to the letter of the, the law, that may imply that you cannot uh, give, for example, an, an ad of a quick uh, fast food to a person that uh, has a metabolic illness. And some solutions include registered algorithms, auditing algorithms. Uh, the very interesting paper, in fact, uh, this year, where uh, the group of Northeastern Auditing Algorithms published a real audit in a hiring uh, software uh, company. So we have several human practices, I will skip this, but these are based on some cognitive biases. And we have some professional biases on, on for example, uh, even there are some papers that show that the biases of the coders are transferred to the code. So this is much more complicated than we think. So what things we can do? Well, we, we should an, analyze for known and unknown biases. We should recollect more data in sparse regions. And we should uh, not use attributes associated directly, directly with hardware bias. We should uh, have the system aware of the problem and we have the users aware of the problem. Some recommendations to end. Basically that learning from the past doesn't mean to reproduce it. Uh, have people in control, not in the loop. And remember that ethics is not something that depends only on you, it also depends on your providers and your clients. So remember that everything is a mirror of us. And Hester Henderson asked, can a algorithm ever be ethical? Well, they are not human, so maybe they cannot be ethical. And David Lauer, uh, ask something obvious, but it's very important. You cannot have AI ethics without ethics. So, uh, thank you.